Hi, this is Melinda Cusera, your indie fantasy author, and today I'm not doing an interview. My the person who signed up for an interview for today um, didn't show up, so instead I'm going to read chapter 24 from Curse Breaker Enchanted. So let's go. 30 minutes later, Nolo untied the blindfold. It fell away, revealing piles of bread, oats, nuts, smoked meat, and dried fruits. When are you going out with these? Sarn gestured to the piles of buckles. Now would be awesome, but Nolo's sour expression killed all hope of that. Soon. We haven't set up a date yet. We're waiting for a fair weather report. The last augury called for storms and gale force winds. But you know how it goes. Nolo shrugged. Tomorrow, they might have a different prediction, so I need these made up. Sarn nodded and opened his mouth, but Nolo held up a hand for stalling him. You said you'd abide by my decision. Nolo hardened his glare. Yes, but... No buts. Let's see what the book says. If there's something in one of the other books, tell me, please. I need to know. Nolo ran a hand through his braids, making the beads on their ends click together. All right. I'll tell you once we receive all the copies and update the master log. But you need to stop obsessing over this. It's not healthy, and it could take a while to collect all that information. In the meantime, you must drop it and move on with life. How could he move on? when a ghost child haunted his steps and monsters threatened his son. Sarn rounded the table, stacked with goods in silence, aware he had to say something to mollify his master. In the end, Sarn just nodded. You remember how to pack these? Nolo lifted a jumble of cloth and buckles from the pile. Sarn nodded again and rattled off the packing list. He'd done this so many times he could assemble the packs in his sleep, and Nolo knew it. If Nolo would go away until morning, Sarn could sneak outside and search for clues. Good, I'll leave you to it. Nolo walked out, then stuck his head back in. If you get hungry, there's some stew in back. It might still be warm, and my wife made biscuits to go with it. Make sure you eat something before I see you again. You're too thin. Damn, Nolo intended to check on him, and he'd better be here when the man showed up. Sarn squeezed a sack of oats in frustration at the implied threat. That left only one avenue to gather information, one he'd used too often already today, magic. Too much magicking led to blackouts. If Nolo happened by during one of those, Sarn would end the night with a visit to the damned infirmary. Did you hear me? Nolo asked. Yes, Stu's in back, eat something, I heard you. Sarn pushed some items over to make space, but his eyes kept catching on the unkindled Lumiere crystals. Why had he sensed none at either murder site? What had those hikers used for light and heat? Sarn plucked a crystal from the pile, holding it between his thumb and forefinger. He felt its cold roughness and the shadow coiled in its belly. Impure, complained his magic. Then it listed all its inclusions until Sarn dropped the rock. It bounced off its mates, causing the pile to slide towards the edge. Closing his eyes, Sarn ran his ungloved palm over the table and felt nothing until he touched those stones. Only then did his other senses break down their composition. Sarn recalled the icy darkness blanketing both murder sites. Could it extinguish Lumiere crystals? He seized a stone, but it lit on contact. Kindling Lumiere had become a reflex action over the years. Damn the rangers. Cursing Sarn grabbed another and damned his magic, slowing its flow to a trickle. He narrowed his awareness down to the stone in his hand and the waiting cavity in its heart. The rock blazed as he withdrew his senses. Still too fast. Sarn cursed and picked up another. He drilled down, attenuating his magic until it struck a filament. It would cast its light down through the ages, radiant until its internal store of magic was depleted. He kindled another and another, each time watching the process. Nolo could keep him out of the forest, but not the mystery haunting it. After an hour... Sarn set a luminous pink rock aside and staggered to the stew pot to ease the hunger cramping his gut. He was on to something, but avoiding a blackout took precedence. While he shoveled stew into his mouth with a biscuit, Sarn turned over everything he knew about the Lumiere crystals and their luminosity. Could the ignition process be reversed? What could strip a Lumiere crystal of its light and magic? Sarn sat on a pile of straw dummies and surveyed the cluttered cave for an answer. Unstrung bows of every length and construction hung from pegs on the wall. One called to Sarn, and his magic slid along his hands. 
He yearned to touch the bow staves. It had been months since they'd let him shoot. Three bowls full and four biscuits later, he left his dishes to soak in a pan of soapy water before confronting the Lumiere crystals again. Sarn touched a lit stone and tried to withdraw the magic he'd given it. Nothing happened. His magic remained ensconced in the rock. Voices caught his attention. Sarn grabbed an unlit Lumiere crystal and drifted out of the cave, fingering the stone in his hand. Magic flowed over its nooks and crannies as he listened hard. What was going on out there? Was the Queen of All Trees still waiting for him? Was she in danger? Sarn imagined her silver splendor surrounded by infected trees and rivers of oily black contagions until a polite cough startled him. Sarn dropped his gaze ten inches to the crown of Inari's head, then backpedaled out of the danger zone. There were women, and then there was Inari. Beautiful failed to describe her. Incandescent came closer to the mark. There was an extra dimension she alone possessed, and he was staring at her like a fool. He had to look away. She was Nolo's wife for hell's sake. But his eyes refused to stray from her face. Red light burst out of the Lumiere crystal in his hand. The stone's glow gave her café au lait features a rosy hue as his magic dampened its heat so it wouldn't burn him. I overheard my husband talking, and I figured I'd give you a hand. Inari shrugged, a toned shoulder. A hand? Sarn repeated, unable to make sense of her explanation. Yes, with the pax. Inari stepped past Sarn into the chamber, leaving him flabbergasted and confused. Inari was older than him, as was every woman he'd ever crushed on. She had a decade on him, which put her around thirty. Eel, Sarn trailed off as words abandoned him. He flailed around for something to say, but he found nothing and shut his mouth. What could he talk about with this angel? He was the dirt under her well-tailored boot heel, a whore's unwanted bastard. Worse still, he had a bastard of his own, but he adored that boy. Ran was the light of his life. Sarn glared at the stone in his hand, feeling dirty and empty. Thank fate his propensity for cloaks and deep hoods hid his greasy hair and filthy clothes. But his eyes glowed, showering his unwashed, stubble-covered face in unflattering emerald light. He stank, too, and he'd worn the same clothes for a few days. Funny how he hadn't noticed that until now. Soap, water, and a razor. He needed to make a date with all three the next time he had five minutes of peace. His face burned as Sarn turned away from her sparkling cleanliness. Inari had pulled her hair into a waist-length braid, and she smelled fresh as a summer flower. He was dirt, and she was a polished diamond, so bright and beautiful it hurt to look at her. I can make them myself, Sarn said when the silence became unbearable. If she helped, Nola would find some other busy work to do, far from the doors. At least here he could overhear something. Sarn placed a red Lumiere stone into a lead-lined box. I have an ulterior motive for helping you. Sarn heard the smile in her voice and clamped down hard on the reaction her words produced. He was only twenty, and it had been a long while since... Sarn picked up a jumble of cloth and buckles and fumbled it into something resembling a pack. It had been a while since he'd slept with anyone, and that reason was a precocious child named Ran. Oh, fates, how he missed the lovable little rascal. Sarn crammed a handful of oats into the bucket meant for them and pinned his eyes to the table and its offerings. It was safer to regard the kit he was assembling than to look at Inari. She was everything he'd ever wanted, but she was married to one of his masters. What did you have in mind? Sarn asked, failing to mask his inner turmoil. Now would be a terrific time for ghosts to show up or the fate stamp for us to have a tantrum, anything to get out of this cave. Practice. Specifically archery. Practice. Inari heaved a one-shoulder shrug, oblivious to his discomfort. I want to keep my skills sharp, and I prefer to shoot with a partner. I figured you could use the practice, and I wanted to make sure you're okay. You didn't look well when I last saw you. Well, archery practice explained the leathers clinging to her curves. Thank fate his baggy clothes hid how much he liked them. Her dark eyes searched him. What was she looking for? Oh, right, signs of illness since he'd passed out at her feet yesterday. I don't need a healer. Sarn spotted a darker stone amid the pile and reached for it. But a spark jumped from his finger to the stone, turning its glow on before he touched it. Sarn gritted his teeth at more evidence of his freakishness and shoved it into a pack. If his face got any redder, he'd make a tomato jealous. Time for a topic change. I didn't say you did. I know you don't like them, Inari said. Doesn't Nolo shoot with you? Inari shook her head as she threaded a strap through a buckle. He doesn't approve of my interest in such sports. 
Her casual response caught Saren off guard, and he knocked over a stack of bandages. Damn it! He bent to collect them in his wits, too. Shadows melted into the south wall, as if some force drew them out of the mountain. They left behind a void, and the cave and the piles of gear scattered about lost one of its dimensions. When Inari bent to pick up a few stragglers, Saren stopped her. Something strange was happening. Better if she stayed ignorant of it. I dropped them. I'll fetch them. It's only fair. All right, I'll keep the assembly line going. Sar nodded, even though she couldn't see it from her side of the table. He touched the ground, and his magic crawled down the tunnel and out of the main doors. How's your brother doing? He's fine. Since he followed Myron's academic progress like a sport, Sarn rattled off his brother's test scores, paper grades, and the theses of his assignments without taking his mind off his magic. It was flowing across the meadow now. Could he send it past the menhares into the forest? His magic washed over the spectral feet of the ghost boy and recoiled. Snapping back so fast it gave Sarn whiplash, he landed on his butt and pain punched him in the face. A purple afterimage of a thirteen-pointed star in a circle danced before his eyes. Blood dripped from his nose and Sarn wiped it on his sleeve. Im, Meyer, Arador, whispered a voice only he heard, and Sarn still had no frickin' clue what it meant. You've done a superb job raising your brother, Inari said, oblivious to his painful spill. Cold air buffeted Sarn as he rose and came eye to eye with the ghost boy. Fear clouded the ghost's milky green eyes. What could frighten a ghost? Don't be embarrassed. You should be proud of him. You've earned the right. Inari squeezed his shoulder. She let go before drifting back to the table and those packs. Quite a pile had formed while he'd mucked about with the headache-inducing magic. Sarn still had no answers, just a feeling that things were wrong and growing more so by the minute while he stood there, assembling kit bags. Sarn nodded to Inari, thanking her without words for her support because it seemed like the right thing to do. It also bought him time to regroup. With shaking fingers, he resumed stuffing whatever came to hand into the first pocket his fingers found. They must be almost done. Inari's slender fingers still when the warden's voices swelled. You can hear them? Sarn asked. Inari nodded, and her face softened as she noted his surprise. Sarn touched his bad ear, then let his hand fall back to the pile of ribbons he'd sorted. Each pack carried the same items, but in different proportions, depending on the campsite. They're talking about you. Her smile slipped and flipped into a frown of concentration. They? There was only one voice he kept hearing. Oh, right, the wardens. Sarn had forgotten they were nearby. Echoes of stamping feet interrupted a mumbled monologue. Inari laid a warm hand over his. Before Sarn could stop it, his magic scanned her, throwing a barrage of information at him. None of it's sensible. What are they saying? Inari's eyes answered his question. Nothing good. Sarn nodded, and she squeezed his hand before letting go. Her warmth lingered on his skin, and it felt good, too good. His magic had welcomed her touch, and so had he. She was his master's wife, for hell's sake. He should not like her, but fates damn him, he did. I know what they're saying about me. Sar needed to drive a wedge between them, to make her see him for what he was. I'm a freak, and you know what? They're right. Sarn slammed the last pack down, and its blue ribbon fluttered in the breeze. You're unique, but you're not a freak. You've lived a hard life, yes, but you've got a good heart, and it's always in the right place. Her words applied a soothing balm to the cuts her husband's remarks had made earlier. They're talking about what Grigori did, and they're angry he dragged you off somewhere and ditched you. Inari's dark eyes urged him to believe it, but dare he? Sarn shook his head. They don't like me. He found this reversal in attitudes hard to swallow, but her dark eyes, so earnest in their attention, tipped unbelief into belief and knocked Sarn to a sit on the edge of the table as his world rocked around him. She linked her arm through his and tugged him toward the door. Come on, we're finished here. It's dreamer's hour, and I fancy a bit of shooting and maybe a little competition before I retire. I heard you're a natural. The ghost boy flashed to the cave's entrance and extended his arms to block their way. He shook his head in terror. As if cued, the bells of Mount Eredrin tolled twenty-four times, marking the hour as midnight. They echoed in the preternatural silence of the maze. Sarn gave the ghost a reassuring look as he walked through the ghost's arm and stopped. A rat stared at him the same one from the kitchen. The malevolence radiating off the creature made him wonder. Was someone watching him through the rat's eyes? 
Was this watcher Rat Woman or someone else? The rangers on guard stopped talking. For a moment, Sarn feared they'd seen the specter huddled against his leg or the creepy rat scurrying after them. Heard you knock Grigori down flat, commented Cyril. You can open your eyes, kid. There's no one around except us to see him, and we know what they look like. Sarn did as bid and played the emerald glow of his eyes over the lanky Cyril. To his credit, the Mohawk sporting ranger ignored the light as he searched the man's face for anything amiss. Well, he deserved it, Cyril continued when Sarn failed to comment. Maybe being the victim of Grigori's test had earned him a measure of respect by accident. Later he'd think on that. Sarn scanned the moonlit meadow below. Something was out there, but it waited beyond his line of sight. The moon's a full one tonight, added Bashin from the opposite side of the giant door showering them in pale gold light. It's a good night for a bit of shooting if you're minded. Cyril flashed a smile at Inari. We might have placed a small wager on our kid beating you nine times out of ten. No respect meant, ma'am, but the kid's got talent. And now they were complimenting him in a backhanded manner, but it still was praise. His face heated up. Embarrassed, Sarn nodded to the two rangers, then hightailed it to the switchback trail leading down the mountain. His gaze locked on to the impenetrable darkness blotting out the enchanted forest. Not a single leaf glowed tonight. Something had snuffed out the forest's bioluminescence. Was it the same thing that had turned the forest against him yesterday? A natural, said his magic. I figured, tell me something I don't know, like how to fix it. But his magic didn't. Instead, his magic increased his eyes glow until a green nimbus encased him, turning Sarn into a walking target. fan frickin tastic Sarn gritted his teeth. He was a beacon calling to whatever wrongness had gripped this land. But his radiance highlighted trip hazards, making the descent less treacherous. Inari's grateful smile warmed Sarn all the way to his toes until the ghost boy's icy fingers recalled his attention. Now wasn't the time to revel in her company. At the bottom of the trail, they stepped onto the meadow. Nothing stirred the long grasses, not even the wind. Thickets of arrows stuck point first in the ground a hundred yards from their respective targets. Inari unslung a leather tube and removed a recurve bow. She strung it and waited while Sarn did the same with a long bow someone had left for him. Someday he would teach his son to shoot. But he put the thought out of his mind so he could concentrate on calling out the wrongness. Holding the bow in his right hand, Sarn withdrew an arrow from the ground. Show yourself. I dare you. You don't frighten me. But it should, and the thought gave Sarn pause. His gaze strayed to the shuddering ghost boy hiding his face in his pant leg. The specter peeked at Sarn, and its pale, terrified eyes pleaded with him to stop. I can't, he whispered to the ghost. I have to do this. Magic rolled over the flint arrowhead in his hand, turning it a radiant green. Connection established. Sarn knocked, sighted, and drew the bow. Feeling muscles in his upper back pull tight, he released the arrow, and it sped past the standing stones into the darkness beyond. His will flew with the shaft and its sensory payload. The string slapped his right forearm, but he ignored its sting. The arrow landed point first in the dirt, and a remnant of his magic dashed back to Sarn, sending flashes of roots, rocks, and leaves, all of them motionless. Why were they still? Their immobility raised his hackles. To keep up the ruse, Sarn fired two arrows at the target, hitting it dead center. He grabbed another arrow and shot it south toward the river. Nothing there either. Was he losing his mind? A blur jumped up to common rock and perched on its top. Its beady eyes glared at Sarn as its body tensed, ready for anything. It was too far away to attack him or Inari and too small to do much harm. Aiming high, Sarn fired two more arrows and targeted other sections of the forest. Had something broken its enchantment? What the hell was he mixed up in? A magical nudge here or there kept the two projectiles defying gravity far longer than any arrow should. As Sarn curved their trajectories, he fired off three more at the straw target, planting them in a tight cluster to satisfy the rangers watching from the cliff, then resumed sending arrows into the forest hunting for information. His last arrow bounced off a tree, rousing it, proving its enchantment still held. Thank fate. The arrow plummeted until something plucked it out of the air and it snapped the shaft in half. After he dropped the broken arrow, a blurry man ground it under his boot. Moonlight fell on Hadravel as the man stepped out of the forest. Those miserable eyes locked onto Sarn as the psycho lumbered toward him. No, it couldn't be. 
With shaking hands, Sarn snatched an arrow, knocked, sighted, and drew so fast he blurred. Thunk. The arrow passed through Hadrival's chest, but the man kept coming. You're dead. I saw. Sarn seized another arrow and fitted it to the string. He's dead, kid. He can't hurt you anymore. Jola assured Sarn from the depths of memory, but the commander had lied. Sarn shot two more arrows. Hadrival swelled until the psycho loomed over him. Every arrow found its mark, decorating the psycho's chest with a death's head of fletching, a grim smile included. But Hadrival refused to die. He just kept coming. Sarn reached for an arrow, but his hand closed on empty air as his back slammed into common rock. The damn thing was the size of a giant's boot. Gripping the long bow in both hands, Sarn swung it. Green lightning snaked along the bow, but it splintered when it struck Hadrival's chest, raining green embers onto the ground. Sarn reversed his grip on the now sharpened stave and stabbed. But the psycho didn't even flinch when the magic riddled wood punctured his chest. One good slap knocked the stave loose, leaving no blood or wound behind. As he recognized the glint in Hadrival's eye, rage consumed Sarn. Not this time. The psycho wouldn't give him any more orders. Magic leaked out of every pore. Sarn ripped the rocks out of the earth and hurled them at Hadrival before the beast could utter a single word. The projectiles piled up into a card, and the thing masquerading as Hadrival flickered like a guttering flame. He wasn't Hadrival. The realization knocked Sarn to his knees. So profound was his relief. Or perhaps exhaustion had sapped his strength. He had done far more magic in the last few hours than he could remember ever doing before. Pain probed at the spot between his eyes, presaging a headache. What are you? Hadrival's doppelganger grinned, bearing yellowed teeth. Then he shattered, sending red sparks into the breeze. An invisible force spun those fragments into a thirteen-pointed star before it hit Sarn between the eyes. He collapsed in screaming pain as the star cut through his mind, raising memories in its wake. Six years ago. Through a chink in the stone wall, Sarn caught the dark eyes of a slender figure swathed in a white cloak and cowl. The sacrifice stepped into a forest of candles and took Hadrival's hand. The youth held his gaze as incantations in a guttural language assaulted his ears and scratched at his sanity, pressure built, almost flattening Sarn as something ground against reality's thin veil. Thirteen Karns surrounded his narrow prison, and twitching fingers poked out of the nearest one. Oh, fate, there was an orphan entombed in those Karns. The dying children's screams turned into hacking coughs as a sulfurous stink choked the air. Now... You killed them, Sarn shouted at Hadrival as the memory shattered. He rocked as pain stabbed his eyes. Inari's rose-scented arm wrapped around his shaking shoulders and her breath tickled his hair. It's all right, I'm here. And Sarn wanted her to hold him forever, but this was wrong. She belonged to another, so he pushed her away. Once he was vertical, Sarn stumbled away from her, putting some distance between them. Stay out of this or someone you love dies, said Hadrival's doppelganger. Sarn pivoted, but the creature had disappeared. Only his warning remained, echoing with each heartbeat. I saw a shadow monster, Ran had confessed, his little face screwed up in fear. Sarn's arms ached to hold his son and protect the boy from everything. Know those words from earlier replayed. You have to let it go. How could he? Sarn met the frightened eyes of the ghost boy. No, he would see this through to the bitter end. He had no choice now. His son was in danger, and it was his fault. But he was more lost than ever before. Where could he turn for answers? Look inside you, whispered his magic. Sarn reeled at the possibility. How could the answer be inside him? What the hell are you doing? Jerlo demanded as he rounded common rock. Inari started at the commander's sudden appearance, but Sarn just stared at the blood dripping down his throbbing arm. A crimson drop splashed onto the earthen lips opening to catch it. The ground shook and something shot out of it. Sarn caught the object on reflex and stared at a bloodstone keyed to him. Inside the reddish rock, a spark of his magic waited for direction. What the hell? Sarn looked to Jurlo for an answer, but his master's brows drew down in consternation, presaging a lecture, not an explanation. Let me cleanse this, Inari wiped at the blood and the dozens of raised welts along the inside of Sarn's right arm. Her silken touch made his loins itch for some amorous action. Fates damn him to hell. Sarn wanted her warm hands elsewhere on his anatomy. It had been too long, and the magic wanted another Ran. Its demand pounded with his heart, but Ran had to stay an only child. 
After applying a salve she produced from her pocket, Inari wrapped his sore arm in gauze, then stepped back. Keep the wound clean so it heals all right. Sarn nodded. What the hell happened here? Jerlo glared at Sarn. How could he answer that question? Sarn looked at the grinning skull outlined in fletching and shivered. How many arrows had he shot? Too many. No wonder Jerlo looked ready to strangle him. His latest bout of insanity had destroyed a target and created a six-foot carn. Get inside now. Go to my office and sit there while I decide what to do with you. Jerlo pointed at the mountain. His command tugged on the compulsion, turning Sarn toward the doors, beckoning to him from the mountainside. Before Sarn could blink, he was halfway up the winding mountain trail. The air had a cold bite and a hint of putrefaction to it, one reminiscent of the two murder sites, but he couldn't stop to investigate. Jerlo's orders left no leeway this time. For uncounted miles in all directions, save south where the river flowed, the enchanted forest stood like ranks of spent candles. Their lack of brilliance grated on his nerves until she blazed in the distance on Mount Shear. She raised her refulgent branches. As she extended them to Sarn, her summons reverberated in his bones. He must go to the Queen of All Trees. Sarn stepped onto an inconvenient bluff and crossed it, only to crash into invisible chains. Promises pulled tight, tripping Sarn, and he went down on one knee as Jerlo's last words echoed in his skull, Go to my office and sit there. He had sworn to obey Jerlo, and his master had issued an order. Each word flayed Sarn, abrading his will the longer he knelt there. He must do what his master said. But she called him. Sarn stared at the clumps of grass clinging to the precipice while two desires strove for mastery. White light caressed his face, igniting a memory of a white-robed youth surrounded by a blazing fire. The image sharpened until the candles separated to a circle, winding around a star with thirteen rays. Somehow the event in his past and the murders were connected. Thank you, he whispered, letting the breeze carry his words to the queen of all trees. Her light winked out, breaking the enchantment, and his mind cleared enough for Jerlo's objective to gain the upper hand. Sarn rose, dazed but determined, and stumbled back onto the trail. The ghost boy appeared in front of him and silently urged Sarn to go back. Not you two. I can't go to her. She knows I have orders. But the specter shook his head and motioned for him to turn around. Curiosity spun Sarn on his heel, and he blinked at the dark vista spreading beyond the circle of men hairs. The queen of all trees had vanished into the enchanted forest, and its unnatural darkness had swallowed her. No hint of her radiance remained, not even an afterimage. Is she in trouble? The ghost pointed to where she'd stood, and its pale lips moved in silent speech. Is she? The ghost ignored his question. Sarn folded his arms over his chest. What are you afraid of? You're already dead. Far off a voice whispered, Im, Meyer, Arador. Sarn shuddered. The ghost raised one spectral finger to its wide eyes, then dissipated in a gust of wind, leaving Sarn alone with the night and too many questions without answers. He kicked a stone, sending it clattering down the mountain. Jerlo's icon on his head map moved, spurring Sarn into action. He pivoted and continued up the pr trail. But as the gravel path bent to climb between two rock formations, Sarn felt a malevolent presence. His head map added a marker for this new menace then subtracted it a moment later as a rat darted across his path. It turned beady eyes on him, and the force of its hatred pushed Sarn back a step. Was it one of Ratwoman's attendants? For a long, tense moment, he and the entity looking out through the rat's eyes remained locked in a standoff. Something held its hatred in check. Was it Ratwoman or some someone else? Had Hadrival distracted him from a larger problem? It was possible, and the possibility frightened Sarn. Rocks crumbled where he gripped an outcropping in frustration. The rat fled into the shadows lining the trail. Sarn shivered at the close call before plodding onward up the mountain's more scenic face. Around the next bend, Sarn found Cyril and Bichine still guarding the doors. The former whistled and the latter clapped Sarn on the back, spinning him around. An apology wrote itself across Bichine's blocky features right before the rangers slammed Sarn into a rock wall and pinned him there. Sorry, kid. I have to search you. Don't make this any harder than it must be. Orders are orders. Before he'd even stopped speaking, Bashin kicked his feet apart. Maybe they'd heard about his earlier evasion. Rumors traveled at the speed of thought in the mountain stronghold, especially when they pertained to him. Sarn gnashed his teeth. From their vantage high on Mount Eredrin's shoulder, Bashin had a perfect view of his loss of control. 
Fear made their sweat stink and their breath catch as they prodded Sarn, seeking concealed weapons. Cyril had joined in two, crowding Sarn. It made him laugh because the only weapon he possessed was magic, and he avoided wielding it when he could. Keep your hands off me. Sarn bit down hard on those words, swallowing them, but his magic reared up and lashed out with a whip of crackling green energy, knocking both men away from him. Sarn turned his back on their stricken faces and pulled his cowl down over his freakish eyes. He ran inside, but the fear in their eyes portended trouble to come. A green glow caught Nolo's eye as he turned, his gut clenching with dread. Sarn should be in the training room, still assembling packs. There had been enough to keep the kid busy and out of sight all night unless someone had lent a hand. No! Nola repeated the word between breaths as he charged across the meadow, but the wind swallowed his negation. The kid stood, cloaked and cowled as always, but his eyes blazed, throwing green light for half a mile in every direction. Magic flowed through the long bow in the kid's hands, lighting up the wood. An arrow pulled free of the ground and sailed toward the kid's open palm. Its flint head glowed green as the kid knocked, sighted, and drew so fast he blurred. As the arrow flew, emerald lightning crackled around it. A thicket of arrows outlined a grinning skull on a decimated target. Repeated pummeling had splintered one of its supports. Unperturbed, the kid held out his hand again, but no arrow rose to meet it. The kid swung his bow at the target, splintering it. Nolo slammed into an invisible wall and bounced off it. He punched the barrier, but the damn thing refused to yield. Sarn, he shouted, but the kid's magic charged the air, so each lungful delivered a painful zap to his insides. Stop it, Sarn. Listen to me. Rage rattled the chains of Nolo's sanity. Who had caused this? Was it Radispara? Had she obeyed Durlo's edict? No, she knew why the kid must never focus his attention, and by extension his magic, on any task. Had Grigori orchestrated this tragedy? Dear God, it was possible after the stunt his friend had pulled yesterday. Nolo's hands curled into fists. If Grigori had anything to do with this, he'd... Stones lifted off the riverbank and hurled towards Sarn, but the kid just rocked, lost in his delusions. At the last second, the stones swept upwards, describing a graceful arc. They remained suspended by will alone until gravity crashed them down, creating a Karn as tall as its creator. Helpless, Sarn watched. Months of work crumble. He screamed in negation along with the kid. It was happening again, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. Or was there? A familiar weight settled on his back. He could just reach up, seize an arrow, and no. Nolo laced his fingers together over his abdomen. But Death's arrows tempted him. You could mark him for a good end. Why let that capricious bitch fate decide how he dies? Wouldn't a peaceful death be better? Or do you want him to suffer? No, Nolo towed the black quiver. He would not shoot at a child. For that's what Sarn was, a boy stuck in a man's body, one ill-equipped to handle life's harsh realities. Death's marksman does not mark children. Point taken, the black quiver of death quieted, but he still carried the burden. A lithe figure darted forward, distracting Nolo. She was a familiar woman-shaped silhouette against the magic's glow. Inari skidded on the grass and threw an arm around the kid's shoulders. Sarn was shouting now, You killed them! Someone was inside the green dome of the kid's magic. Squinting, Nolo recognized the huntress pattern dyed on the woman's back and the waist-length braid of black silk bisecting it. Inari had caused this drama. He'd expected her to ask Ranispar to shoot with her since the two women had been best friends for nigh on a decade already. They did everything together, so why not archery? Of all the people Inari could have chosen, why had she picked Sarn? Nola looked to the stars for answers, but those cold pinpricks hid behind clouds, and God kept his peace. Maybe Sarn vexed the Almighty too. Nolo gave that radiant barrier one last punch and it shattered, freeing him. Nolo rushed forward, but Jerlo beat him to the kid. Whatever emotional storm had caused, this must have ended because rationality had returned. Sarn stared agog at what he'd wrought under the magic's influence. Inside now, Jerlo pointed at the mountain. Go to my office and sit there while I decide what to do with you, said the commander. Sarn left without saying a word. Nolo changed course to follow him. The kid always has a seizure. After magical displays, someone should be with him because it promised to be a bad one. But when Nolo caught sight of his stricken wife, outrage detoured him to her side. How dare she stand there like she'd done nothing wrong? Anger hardened Nolo's voice into a truncheon and he swung it at her. What were you thinking? We stopped giving him archery lessons because of this. Inari rounded on him, anger coloring her cheeks. Have you ever bothered to figure out why this happens? 
I didn't think so. He has magic. You can't hide it away or pretend it doesn't exist. He'll never learn to control it if you keep him away from everything that triggers it. And Nari's eyes flashed and her breast heaved as she st stabbed Nolo in the chest with a calloused finger. And before you accuse me of anything, this wasn't my intention. I didn't know this would happen. Nolo glanced at his boss, but the commander just watched the argument without comments. And Nari seized her husband's chin and turned his head back to face her. All I know is you used to teach him archery. Then those lessons stopped. When I suggested we shoot for a bit, he was happier than I've ever seen him in a while. I know what I'm doing. Nolo folded his arms over his chest. And Nari quirked a brow, questioning his assertion. The only person he needed to justify his actions to was Jerlo. He was responsible for the kid's well-being, not her. Jerlo cleared his throat and pointed at the papers clutched in Nolo's offhand. What have you got there? Something the kid asked for. Nolo passed the unread pages to his boss who perused them. I thought I told him to drop it. Jerlo shook his head and stuffed the papers into his pocket. Now I know what caused this. Care to share that rationale? Inari asked, reminding them of her continued presence. She watched both men with her hawk eyes. Nolo opened his mouth to give his standard reply of ranger's business, but Jerlo spoke first. A sad affair involving some travelers, which I told the kid to forget about since there's nothing we can do. We were a day late and a few lives short. Inari accepted Jerlo's explanation with a grim nod. People died all too often in the wild because of ill luck, disease, or unpreparedness. Jerlo patted his frizzy hair and sighed. What will we do with him? You can't pawn him and his problems off on busy work. It won't solve anything. And if you keep that up, it'll alienate him completely. Inari met both men's gazes with a steely one of her own. Then she retrieved her bow and returned to the mountain. Jerlo whistled. She's some woman. Yes, she is. Nolo watched his wife until she vanished behind a rock formation. She was a lot more than he'd bargained for ten years ago when he'd wed her. We should have Sarn clean up this mess, but he's been visible enough for one night. Jerlo kicked a stone, but his gaze rested on the target, which had fallen on its side. We can't leave this mess until morning. I've got a meeting down here, and if anyone sees this, it'll raise too many questions. I'll take care of it. Burn it. Get those two. Jerlo waved in the general direction of the door wardens to help you. Impress upon them the danger of speaking about this to anyone. Not even another ranger. This goes no further. Agreed. What about those pages? He'll ask if I check the book. Nolo pulled out a Lumiere stone as a shadow fell over them. Gold light illuminated Jerlo, giving his boss a demonic aspect. You found nothing, so there's nothing to tell. You want me to lie to him? Lie to a kid who could speak only the truth. The idea made Nolo's heart clench with dread, but he'd lied to the kid before to protect him. I want him to drop this and move on with life. It's not healthy, this obsession he's nurturing. It stops tonight. No argument here. Do you want me to take care of this now or deal with him? I'll deal with him. You're on damage control. Jerlo turned to go, but he stopped. The 16th of July. Are you planning to be around then? Lord Grishel's birthday celebration is still the 16th? Yes, but I expect it will change. Don't make any plans for the last two weeks of July. I'll need you here for, oh hell, you don't want to know. It's madness, this spectacle they're planning. Sheer madness. Jerlo stalked off, grumbling about mad nobles and their ill-timed entertainments. Whatever Lady Hyra planned for her son, it would be a nightmare to secure. It could stay his boss's headache for a few more weeks while he tried to figure out what to do with Sarn. Inari's last words repeated like heartburn. You can't pawn him and his problems off on busy work. It won't solve anything. What other choice was there? Nolo looked from the ravaged target to the Karn to the sky. Not even the moon offered any wisdom as she cast her silver eye down on him from a break in the clouds. Would it help if he took the kid with him on his rounds? It would give him more time to prize words from the laconic youth and it might build up some trust. The kid needed something to do. At this point, Nola would try anything, but the forest and the queen of all trees. Could he trust either of those entities to leave the kid alone? And that was the end of chapter 24. So next time we'll pick up with chapter 25. It's really interesting reading this chapter, especially right now, because I just published the 10th book in the Cursebreaker series, and I have about half of the 11th book, and probably about the same of the 12th book and just how many things that are referenced like in this scene alone that uh, we dealt with in book nine, which is specifically Hadrival, and also like the mention of Grishel's birthday, which not really a spoiler, but there's going to be a joust. And, and that is what I hope we're going to be doing in book 12. 
the characters sometimes change their mind about that, but that is my hope that that Joust is finally going to be book 12. And just so there just was so many things in here that, you know, the 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 whole conversation um about like Sar and his magic and and how and Ari's saying that, you know, you can't you can't ignore this and, you know, in Book 10, there's a conversation between Sarn and Nolo. And it's sort of the flip of that. He's sort of taken all of that to heart over the course of the books and is now coming around to the fact that he can't ignore this, that he has to do something about it, and that he wants to do something about it. He wants to be part of it. He actually steps forward to be part of the solution of, you know, what's going on in that book. I'm not going to spoil it for you and tell you about some of the fun things. It's just, there's just so many things. Um, and you know, Rand was finally revealed in book nine, and we see the fallout from that, some of it in book 10, um, specifically with Nolona's family, and we'll get more of the fallout in book 11, um, hopefully with Jerlo and some of the other characters. So it's just really, it's it's just really interesting reading this now um, while I'm working on those and just knowing that I am bringing all those things to a conclusion finally um took 12 books but hey we got there and there's still so much more that Sar needs to do like there's still the curse that he needs to find out about that the queen of all trees mentions in this book and just so many other things i have no idea when he'll actually do it because he doesn't listen to me it, he doesn't follow the outline he's he does his own thing and i just try and get him to the end of the book sometimes i have to change the end of the book because he just doesn't want to do what i thought we were doing at the end of the book but it's all in good fun and that's what happens when you're an author you there's your ideas and then there's your character's ideas and somehow you muddle through to the end so thank you so much for listening um i didn't have an as i said earlier i was supposed to interview um another fantasy author tonight they'd signed up but um it was a father-son team but they didn't show up there's no email there's no message on social media i, I have no idea like what happened i hope they're okay but um, yeah, so I decided that, you know, I, I meant to sit here and record and I had everything all set up, the new microphone and everything. So I thought, you know, I, instead of an interview, I don't want to interview myself. That'd be weird. I know the characters want me to do it in the worst way. They're driving me nuts about it. But um, the microphone doesn't record their voices. Only I can hear them. So I, it, I would be talking to myself. So, but I can read a chapter from my book and instead of doing that. And I, I think we all would prefer that. But, you know, if you would like that in the future, just let me know. And we'll figure out how to make that happen where the characters interview me. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, make sure to set it to auto download or to follow this podcast so you don't miss an episode. There'll be more chapters. Um, I've also I'm also in talks with an actual narrator who is not me to narrate the Curse Breaker series. So that might be coming. It would be. Uh, exclusive to Amazon because I have to do the royalty sh royalty share program. But yeah, I might have more information about that coming up soon. I have one um, audition so far, and it's I yeah I'm really excited about this. I'm I'm still gonna read them, but between my full time job and writing other books like and family commitments, I realistically don't I think that if I were to hire an actual narrator, these would get done faster than me doing it i'm still going to read them because I, I do i do enjoy it it is a challenge although the chapters in chris baker enchanted are really long and i'm really cursing myself for doing that because it, it's it's 43 minutes by now and most of that was the chapter so thank you so much and i'll see you next time again i'm melinda cusera your indie fantasy author and you've been listening to chapter 24 from my book curse breaker enchanted you can get it in paperback ebook and an ai narrated audiobook at the moment and hopefully soon a human narrated audiobook so yeah that's all very exciting and soon a hardcover with the pretty dust jacket and all of that but i'll have more about that soon i'm still working out all of the details and if you've already read curse breaker enchanted then there are nine other books in the series and several prequels several tie-ins there's the his sister series which it's sort of like a crossover that her story weaves in and out of his and it's madness 
but it's fun. So thank you so much. Have a good day or a good night, depending on where you are. And I'll see you next time. Bye.